Hello everyone, welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. Happy New Year. Happy Brew Year, as it were. It is 2018, and one of the ways we're starting 2018 is by looking back at some video from 2017. We've got some new Brew Day videos coming up. We've got some new Pro Brewer videos coming up in the new year, but that's going to be interspersed with some stuff from the 2017 vault, including what you're about to see. What you're about to see is a video of a presentation, or rather it's a panel that I moderated and hosted at um, HomebrewCon 2017 when it was in Minneapolis. And what was happening here is I knew two guys coming from overseas for HomebrewCon, and I kind of started thinking, well, while we have an opportunity to hear from these guys, maybe we can find other international homebrewers and put them all together and kind of do a round table about what it's like to be a homebrewer in other countries uh, so that people here in the States can like hear more about what that's like and hear some trials, tribulation, pros and cons. So what we have here is Brian from Ireland, Gaston from Chile, EJ from Taiwan and China, Miguel from Mexico, slash Southern California and Peter Simons from Australia. You're gonna hear a quick bit from each of them. We've got some pictures of their setups and stuff and we just kind of learn a bit about what it means to be a home brewer in other places besides the United States. Big shout out to the American Homebrewers Association. They actually shot this video and kind of put it together. I just cover it with slides and some photos at different times when they're talking about specific things. But shout out to the AHA for letting us kind of republish this uh, check out all seminars from not only Homebrew Con 2017, but past Homebrew Cons at the Let's Brew section of homebrewersassociation.org and then click on Conference Seminars. So sit back and enjoy this conversation. It's about an hour long. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Hope you learn something. Maybe even pick up a new technique, but I hope you definitely get a new appreciation for this thing that we all love called homebrew and how people handle it around the world and enjoy it around the world. So cheers, chop for chop, international brew for brew. I believe this is the first ever inaugural international brewers panel for homebrew con. Give it up for our international guests. Give it up for yourself for expanding your horizons. Oh, what? Come on. That's all I get for expanded horizons. We kind of wedged a lot of people into this. So there's five panelists. There's an hour. We want to try to have some room for Q&A. So our basic attempt here is going to be everybody's just going to go down the line, really just introduce themselves, how they brew, techniques, problems, advantages, and disadvantages of their different countries. And we're going to hopefully have room for Q&A, but I'm going to kind of prioritize in them. I don't want to cut them off at eight minutes if, if they're talking. Uh, they flew across oceans to get here, so I figured the least we could do is um, give them the respect and the time. So we have Brian Condren from Ireland. <laughs> Gaston Rivera from Chile. <laughs> EJ from Taiwan. Miguel Lota from Mexico, Peter Simons from Australia. So we're going to kind of do this in alphabetical order from your left to right. Peter Simons thinks he's going to like filibuster once we get to him. So we're going to try to keep that in check. Uh, we're going to start with Brian. And um, I might interject with some things. We're going to try. They all sent a bunch of pictures. But clearly, we're all kind of just new at this, a little nervous maybe even. So the pictures may not always match what they're talking about, but these will be from their home breweries or the other beer-related things that they do. All right. I appreciate you. Brian, you can grab it or you can just kind of, there you yeah, go. It's probably easier if we just hand this along. Because this five people, two microphones doesn't work. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, hello, America, and all of that. Uh, I'm Brian. Uh, I'm a civil engineer by trade. I work for Dublin Airport in Dublin in Ireland. And uh, it's actually kind of to do with my uh, chosen career path that I became a home brewer because in the end of 2008, there was this big recession and a lot of construction projects were canceled. So I lost my job as a civil engineer. And I needed some sort of hobby that would fill my uh, time rich but cash poor days. So I decided let's take up home brewing. And that's when I became a home brewer in early 2009. Now, I did uh, attempt a homebrew before that. Um, I don't really count it, uh, but uh, 
10 years earlier uh, when I was a student, I tried home brewing, and, and in the uh, early 2000s in Ireland, home brewing did not exist. There was uh, one mail order place in, in Dublin that sold home brewing ingredients. I ordered a load of ingredients uh, for making my first batch, and uh, what the, was common at the time is what's known as the kit and kilo, as we call it in Ireland, where you get a, a can of a liquid, hopped liquid malt extract, and you add that to water and add one kilogram of uh, table sugar and uh, see what happens. Uh, I successfully made beer, well, depends if you, how you define success. I got students to drink it, so uh, it, it was a success. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the way this uh, arrived, uh, you got a knock on the door one evening and the actual owner of the, the, uh, the homebrew store would uh, land in the door with a big box full of uh, kits, and these kits came in a one and a half kilo uh, aluminium and can. I know I'm saying kilo and aluminium, and a lot of people are getting very confused right now. <laughs> this had no label on it, just written on a sharpie was the word beer. And <laughs> yeah. So fast forward to 2009, and I initially started making, uh, uh, doing uh, extract using the partial boil method with a uh, 12 liter pot on my stove, and after a while, I got tired of that, so I moved on to the more traditional, the, the all grain, where I, I purchased. Uh, I can see on screen right now, there's my, uh, my picnic cooler mash tun, which is, I'm pretty uh, sure that's quite common over here as well. And then I, I also purchased a, a, a brew kettle, a, a brew kettle which, when uh, was briefly featured in an episode of Chips Chop and Brew, blew a lot of people's minds because one thing, it's electric. Two, it's got a direct fire 2000, uh, sorry, direct uh, 2000 watt heating element that's actually inside the wort. And three, it's made of plastic. <laughs> and this blew a lot of people's minds. And it's actually something I've never considered myself because this is how everybody starts in Ireland. These uh, uh, kettle fermenters, uh, they're quite common because, uh, they're not common over here, I know, because the voltage means it would take too long to bring something to a boil. I think it's 110 volts is the municipal electricity supply over here. It's 230 for us. so. It, we bring uh, water to a boil a lot quicker. But the kettle itself is made of uh, polyethylene plastic, which is rated to up to around 200, and it's food grade and all of that. So there's, you know, there's no problems here. But it's still, if you're not used to it, it, it has blown a lot of people's minds. And it's probably the most comments we've ever gotten on, <laughs> on a video uh, on YouTube about, what, you're brewing with, with plastic? You know, so um, I've, I've since moved on from, uh, from that uh, setup. Um, uh, I've been. Brewing for a long time, uh, as I said, I, at the time I was uh, time poor, uh, or time rich and cash poor. But uh, since then, uh, my daughter was born nine months ago, and I'm finding I'm not very time rich at the moment. So uh, I decided to cut down the brew day. My previous brew day, it could nearly be 12 hours once I, all the cleaning was done because I, I was quite meticulous with cleaning my equipment when I put it back. So to, to cut down that, I purchased uh, one of the uh, all-in-one uh, brew in the bag uh, electric systems. I purchased a uh, grain fodder. I was quite excited to get this. So can't really talk too much about that. I'm five batches in, and I've gotten the brew day down to five hours, which I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my system. But I'm not, I'm not really here to talk about me because I, I like to introduce people to the the home brewing community in Ireland. And this is a community which has grown exponentially over the the last few years. Um, in 20, 2011, the home, National Homebrew Club of Ireland was uh, founded, and uh, we got the initials NHC, which is why uh, this place has had to change their name. So, we <laughs> 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 all thanks to us. And uh, our, our, our annual uh, uh, brewers conference is called BrewCon as well. So it's nice to see the copy just there as well. But <laughs> 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 so if you want to see what's next uh, for homebrewing in Ireland, just, uh, or homebrewing in the USA, just come to Ireland. Yeah, we're, we're way ahead of everyone. But <laughs> But the, the NHC of Ireland, I shall call it, was uh, founded in 2011 accidentally. <laughs> this is the story. I see the, the image is already on screen. Um, our local homebrew club it was uh, quite small. It was called Irish Craft Brewer. And a lot of the early members of Irish Craft Brewer went on to found uh, craft breweries in Ireland. In uh, 2004, the law was changed so that uh, cra uh, craft brewers, which was defined at the time of breweries smaller than uh, 20,000 hectolitres, since being doubled to 40,000 hectolitres, they didn't have to pay the same duty that the big brewers had to pay. So this led to a lot of people deciding to give it a try because it is more financially viable. And our homebrew club was really, uh, in the early days, a lot of uh, people who had ambitions to become pro, who were trying out their recipes, whatever. So uh, one day on our internet forum, somebody suggested that uh, 
they found a, a, a warehouse in Germany that was offloading cheap corny kegs for 10 euro a pop. And corny kegs at the time were quite difficult to buy in Ireland. I mean, we're a small country, so there isn't really the demand to keep a load of things in a warehouse. So while we get access to pretty much everything we need, you pay through the nose for it. And corny kegs uh, could be costing you upwards of 100 euro, which is about maybe about $120 at the time. So 10 euro a pop, that was huge. However, there was a catch. The minimum order was 200 kegs, and you had to arrange transportation yourself from Germany. Um, yeah, yes we can. That was the motto at the time. This was, <laughs> yes we can. <laughs> Some oh, people man, were skeptical. Within 12 hours of this post on the forum, all 200 slots were already claimed by uh, local home brewers. Uh, I think in the end it was 320 kegs that uh, ended up uh, being ordered. Somebody knew somebody whose son-in-law owned a uh, logistics company, so they got shipped to Ireland. And then to, uh, if you just go back one slide there, Chip, uh, Instead of going to a nice warehouse, they uh, ended up in a suburban housing estate just outside of Dublin where one guy posted saying, the kegs are here, come pick them up quickly before my wife comes home. So. <laughs> <laughs> but since then, the, the National Homebrew Club of Ireland, it's, it's grown. Um, we have uh, uh, done many more group buys. You know, we all got a lot of kegs, so what was next? We had to buy drip trays and taps and everything to, make, to turn our fridges into a kegerator. Um, we've uh, been uh, group buying ingredients, which uh, has actually uh, initially looked like uh, some of the, the local homebrew shops weren't happy about having us uh, uh, ordering huge amounts of hops from uh, Yakima Valley or whatever, but it, we've, it, they've actually shown the homebrew shops that there is a demand for that sort of thing. So after one group buy of all these weird hop varieties that we never saw in Ireland before, suddenly the homebrew shop says, oh, if people like them, we may as well stock them. So uh, it, the group buys have uh, led to uh, that, uh, an improvement in the ingredients available. Uh, what else? The National Homebrew Club of Ireland has organized an uh, annual uh, brew con, as I said earlier, which uh, started three years ago, which is a much smaller version of this. We, it, it takes place in a, uh, in a, uh, a, a theatre which has a seating for about 200 people. Um, we've had a, a, some great uh, guests coming over to speak to us. Uh, we've had the likes of uh, Gordon Strong, we've had uh, Chris White, uh, John Palmer this year, um, mm -hmm. we've had uh, Mr. Chip Walton. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, it's, it's, it's a day from homebrewers all over Ireland to, co to come and uh, meet up, learn something about homebrewing, and in the evening we have this thing which, uh, I don't know if anyone has considered this uh, type of thing before, we call it club night, I don't know, where, where all the homebrew clubs of Ireland bring a few kegs of beer and try to show them off, I don't know, y you'll have it here soon, I say very soon, you'll have it here very soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we also, we are, organize a a, a big competition every year, which for log logistic reasons we have to keep it down to 400 entries, but it's a fully BJCP uh, sanctioned uh, homebrew competition and uh, we're getting there. We've got I think up to 35 judges uh, in Ireland at the moment and uh, it's going quite well. So that's the homebrew scene in Ireland and uh, I'll pass you on to the next person. Um, hello everybody. Um, I'm thank you for you coming in. Thank you. Brian Chief. Um, I'm EJ from Taiwan. I'm just a, I feel a little bit nervous because English is my, not my well language to speak. Uh, uh, I was a homebrewer in three years ago, and this, this year I was turning to another job to be a be an educator in China. So I may introduce some part of a, a homebrew scene in both Taiwan and China for everybody. And this is this photo is my my first batch is brew B I A B brew in a bag. Most of Taiwan homebrew we start with a case, small batch, maybe one gallon. Um, but it's very precious because before 2002, Taiwan is forbidden for all brewing, not not home home brewing, even wine, beer, meat, or everything. After 2002, we entered the World Trade Organization. Then our government just opened the brewing and allow people to brew homebrew right in your house. But um, yes, but after maybe 2010, then we have, uh, when we start homebrewing culture start in Taiwan, we buy more than one, one kilogram. Okay, this is our hops, one ounce hops. We don't, Taiwan is a quite hot weather and we rain it, we rain it so we can't grow malt, barley or wheat. That's why we always add hops. So we have to import hops, 
body and every almost every ingredient to Taiwan. Oh, this is my setup. Quite small. Uh, this is a 2000. The 20 liter batch is a plus five gallon because you know even Taiwan government allow us to brew it after 2002, but we they only allow we storage 100 liter maybe five. 25 gallon of beer in our hot, hot in our basement. No more than what 25 gallon. That's why we have very small batch, and so we are facing a problem. We don't have we because we can't brew too much beer, and we don't grow any plants. So we we are seeking for some fresh ingredients. Some of my friends that join me in this tour, we're looking. We are going to humble supply later just to find some fresh yeast, fresh hops. That's really re is rare in Taiwan. Okay, this is uh, our humble, humble competition. Last year in 2016, our fifth humble competition. We're getting more and more judges, but last year we only have 15. It's now. Um, yesterday I was judge in American Humble Associations. Competition is quite amazing. Hundreds of judges. That's why we are going to fight, fighting for. We need more homebrewers and more judges to improve the brewing, the beers, the quality. Yeah, yes, that's we. And oh, because we are small, Taiwan is a quite small island. You you can drive from the northeast southeast way to the northeast way in four hours. So we can gather everybody in one place every year, once every year. So we share, we all, we ask all the ancients to share their beer. You have to bring one gallon of your beer and share to all other ancients. You have to, it's, uh, you have to share your recipe and they can try, they can ask how you brew. If they like this beer, they will ask you. And if they don't like, our judges will expand the old flavor or anything, they can make improvement. Because we are small, so we want to move faster. And okay, uh, this is Shishan paper I would like to share with you. Somebody, it's a uh, gas. Smell like a uh, Shishan. You may you, you may smell this in Shishan cuisine or Shishan hapa. It's quite famous. Uh, spicy in in beer in China and, and another one is Asmensus. You can try this. It's a dry flower. You can smell it. It's quite aroma is good. And I can say Asmensus. It was in. Almost 20% of wheat beer in China. It's very good combination between osmosis and wheat beer together. So, if you're going to China, you should try some osmosis ale or wheat ale. And China is amazing, I have to say. China is a place where it homebrew beer is illegal to sell, but lots of people selling homebrew beer. You know, this, this equipment was a 2000 liter batch. It's Five, 50 gallon batch. They can sell pump beer and make money, and they can buy more ingredients and buy better equipment and improve their beer. It's quite an amazing place because China is too big. The government can, can't control everybody. So, <laughs> 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 there's a guy, there's a friend from China. He, he brew, but he didn't sell beer. Then, but it's a good thing, you know, if you can make money, by home, by home brewing, you don't have to have your own brewery. Then you can keep practice brewing every day and don't worry about starving and lack of money. So, so it's a good, it's good thing in China. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Miguel. I um, started home brewing in 2011, around that time. Um, I was born in Ensenada, Mexico, which is in Baja, California, on the north side. And then when I was 13, I, uh, my family migrated to San Diego and we, you know, we, I went to school in San Diego. And um, I live in San Diego for the most part uh, of the week, uh, five days a week. I'm in San Diego and then Friday through Sunday, I, I go down to Mexico and, and live there on the weekends uh, so I can support my hobbies. Uh, but um, I, um, I got the beer bug uh, back in 2011, believe it or not, I used to race uh, mountain bikes before I brewed. And uh, we would get together every Wednesday with a, a, a group of guys that, that ride bikes and we'd share beer uh, and, and food at the end of each ride. And so um, there's one guy out of the whole group that w would brew his own beer. 
And I just thought, well, maybe I can start doing the same thing. And I brought myself a, a kit. Um, and then um, around 2012, I, I wanted to learn more about hops. And we have a family ranch in Guadalupe Valley, which is northeast of Ensenada. Um, and so I asked my uncle, hey, you're not doing anything with the ranch, but maybe I can put in a few rhizomes and see if it works. So I bought five different varieties of, of uh, rhizomes, uh, 10 of each, and I started to grow Cascade, Centennial, Nugget, Mount Hood, and Willamette. And don't ask me why I chose those at that time. I was just trying to experiment with uh, different types of, of hops. And then um, all of them worked, except for Willamette. So then I um, said, well, maybe I'll just start growing a little more. So I um, upped my rhizomes to 500. Um, for for the next year, just a little, <laughs> just a little bit, um, and then the you know a year later, then I went to a thousand, and uh, this year I added uh, another variety. So I have eight so far. I added Chinook, Magnum, and Neo Mexicanus, and so I have 1,200 plants right now at the ranch, and uh, every year we have um, a nice uh, picking party. And uh, we call it the Pick'em Brew because we invite all the local brewers, home brewers um, in the area from Mexicali, Tijuana, Ensenada, and whomever you know comes from um, the interior of the country to visit. And then we um, all pick our own hops, or whomever doesn't want to pick their own hops, they just come, have a good time, and people share their beers, their food, the families come over. We have a little... Um, pool for the kids and then uh, this last year everybody camped out so they ended up staying for another day and partied to the next day as well. <laughs> yeah, um, and then so first I, to go back uh, to um, 2012 when I started planting the, the plantation of the hops, um, then I realized that there was nobody that was providing ingredients to brewers in the area um, and I started to uh, bring ingredients from San Diego to Ensenada. Um, one of my family members ha owns a liquor store, so I asked him for a little bit of space, and um, I, I would sell ingredients out of the liquor store for a whole year. So a year after that, then I opened up, uh, I decided to open up the homebrew shop, and um, this year was our second year anniversary at, at that homebrew shop, and we're the only homebrew shop now, there, there used to be another one that was close by, but they had to close, unfortunately. Um, but the, the hop scene is growing, so hopefully, you know, there'll be more, and um, there's about um, 34 homebrew shops all over Mexico. Um, as far as homebrew clubs, I, there was nothing that I could um, get from anywhere, so, so there's no information, or there's no uh, association that's uh, related to home brewing. So I had to reach out to a lot of folks to, to be able to understand how the homebrew scene is all over Mexico. And uh, I probably counted 20-some uh, homebrew clubs in, in all of Mexico. There's probably more that I didn't reach out to. Um, and then I think the oldest one, from what I gather, is the Tijuana Homebrew Club, which is a pretty, pretty good group of folks. Um, there's about 100 in that club. And they all... Um, because of the proximity to San Diego, they have uh, really close ties or friendships with San Diego brewers and San Diego home brewers. And so they get to have speakers come to their meetings and speak about different topics. And so they get a lot of support. And then we're so close to the border, they get in, they, they're able to cross over and buy ingredients from San Diego um, and, so, and, and get a lot of information, most, most of the people in, in Tijuana, Mexicali, and Ensenada, they speak English, so everybody can um, get information from the internet pretty easily and, and then just uh, teach it to others. But um, so uh, as far as the homebrew um, club scene, some of the, uh, uh, the, the unique part of, uh, about uh, the homebrew club scene is that there, there are no rules, so people can just brew and uh, sell to anybody if they want to. The establishment that sells um, liquor or beer, they, they carry the license, and they can have a, a, a craft beer license. I'm sorry, there's no craft beer license. There's a macro 
um, brewing license or a liquor store license, and they can sell just homebrew beer if they if they wanted to or any type of beer. Um, so it's pretty easy for for homebrewers to just become pro brewers once they they make their first batch. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so you see a lot of that, and um, you also um, have that uh, closeness to, to the U.S., so we're able to get information and, and, and be able to talk to people, brew with, with other brewers from uh, all over the U.S., or uh, bring speakers. We have a, a, a beer fest in Ensenada. It's probably the second largest beer fest, um, and this year was their fifth anniversary and, um, and this year they, ha they added two days of conferences where they have s different speakers. We had um, Paul from Alpine Brewing. Um, we also um, uh, have uh, Kara from White Labs. Uh, we have, we've had Chris White come over as well and, and do a, a talk with, the, with us over at the Ensenada Beer Fest and at some other events that we've held. Um, so just being so close to the border helps a lot. What I did, have seen is though a lot of the um, people that brew in the interior of Mexico, they have a harder time uh, getting ingredients. Uh, if they do have ingredients, they're really pricey and, um, and the information they, they gather, are more for, it's more from Spain than from uh, Mexico itself or the U.S. So a lot of their beer styles differ from what the beer styles that, that are being brewed in, in Baja. Um, we're more in Baja, we're brewing more San Diego style, West Coast style beers. And then if you go to the interior of Mexico, you'll see more of a Belgian um, using noble hops and that kind of stuff. So it kind of translates over everything from Baja to Mexico. They have uh, another event called Cerveza Mexico in November every year. Um, and it's probably the biggest conference uh, for beer, for craft beer. And um, um, in their uh, competition, out of 66 medals last year, 33 were won by Baja, uh, California, Baja California uh, breweries. So um, Baja California is considered the mecca of beer in Mexico, and, and I think it just has to do with the proximity to the U.S. that, that helps a lot. And so in my homebrew shop, we try to do uh, free classes to people that, that want to start brewing every couple weeks, and then um, and so we, um, we try to bring in new, new people that way. And then we also have different talks with, with uh, folks from, from San Diego. That's, that's you know, who, who we know, who we have access to and stuff. Um, and then uh, another, another thing about the ingredients is that it's very tough to, uh, as a home, home brew shop owner, is that you have to pay about 35% of your cost in importation. So, uh, the, the prices hike uh, pretty, go up uh, pretty high uh, because of that. And so um, that's one of our, um, uh, what do you call it, um, challenges, you know, with, with being able to, to get equipment and ingredients. And then, um, you know, knowledge, just being able to share the knowledge with everybody. Everybody thinks uh, that once they make their first batch, they can brew, and we're trying to change that uh, through the uh, home, uh, homebrew clubs. Um, we have one in Ensenada, and uh, there's about 30-some members. Tijuana has 100, and then Mexicali has about 24 uh, members. And the Ensenada uh, Homebrew Club um, started a year ago, and I kind of helped start that up. Um, because I'm also part of COF, and a lot of the things that I've learned, I learned from uh, a lot of COF members and a lot of the speakers that, that uh, speak at COF. And then um, I've also went through the San Diego State uh, Business of Craft Beer Program. I was first generation of that, and, uh, and now I'm a board member for them. Um, so I, I try to stay pretty involved, and uh, just because beer is my passion, and. Um, that's what I get to live every, every day, pretty much. <laughs> um, real quick, I was as, as, as in America with the red tape and the tears and the layers. I was talking with Miguel. I was like, so he's he grows these hops. His priority is selling them as fresh hops to breweries. But what's left over 
He then has to go into the phase of drying them, packaging them, and selling them at a store. So I was like, so you have an LLC for your hop farm, right? And your LLC for the hop farm sells it to your LLC of your homebrew shop. He's like, no, no. I think we get confused with how many layers businesses have to go through yeah. in America. Uh, other places, it seems a little hands off. Uh, actually, when I, when I started um, to plan my field, um, I reached out to the uh, agriculture department there in Ensenada, and they didn't know anything about hops. Um, so they said, well, as long as you keep it under two acres, you know, we're not going to bother you and use it as a form of uh, experimentation. Um, so I did, and you know, these guys come in to the ranch once in a while just to, to see how the hops are doing. They, they even put in some of their traps for uh, insects and, and stuff like that, and uh, we let them do that. Um, Actually, we, we started to work with um, a group of guys uh, at the University of Mexico, UNAM, in Mexico City. And we started to do experiments with our rhizomes. Um, and uh, they have a hydroponic uh, area where, they, where they're trying to grow about 1,000 rhizomes this year. And we'll see how they do in a controlled environment where we control temperature, uh, everything, water, and nutrition. And so, Hopefully, if it takes off, then we'll be able to have, you know, some Mexican hops in Mexico City and not just the, the hops that we have, because we're the only ones growing hops in all of Mexico, pretty much. So our next speaker is Gaston, and as you can tell from this picture on the right, Gaston might possibly be the most excited international member <laughs> of the AHA that exists. Gaston, tell us about Chile. Yeah. I, uh... Well, as you can see in the picture, this is when uh, I received the, the, the card and the sticker and everything. So uh, the picture beside, it's a kind of a Facebook group that I created probably a year ago. And uh, Chile, it's a kind of a Italy country. It's long and uh, thin country. So we got people brewing in the north in the desert and uh, in the Atacama Desert, and the, uh, we got guys close to the penguins in our Tantida. So uh, we are a lot of weather, so you can see guys looks like doctors there. So uh, in the middle, in the red part of the picture, this probably the only one female medal winner in the country, so I put it in the center because I have a kind of a uh, admiration for her. As brewing is concerned, I start brewing in a pro brewing equi equipment. I start in, in the probably 50 or 60 gallon batch and then try to replicate that at home, but uh, for space and for other stuff, that three vessel system don't work for me, so I start to brew in a bag. So um, I'm fermenting or conditioning in a, in a plastic bucket like everybody does. But after a few batches, I turned to stainless steel square open fermenters. Uh, that was for two, re two main reasons. I'm obviously an anchor fan. I am the only probably anchor guy here. So uh, I fell in love with the anchor steam. I visited the brewery probably three, four, or five times. Uh, I got uh, emails or talking with the guys. Uh, yesterday was talking with Kevin West, the, uh, kind of the most recognized brewers of the Anchor about uh, whatever. So I designed these two uh, kind of fermenters. Anchor got two kind of fermenters. One uh, is the small one, the widest one for Anchor Steam, and got the other, it's a completely square for ales. So I try to recreate uh, that thing for, a, try to brew as much close as possible to that steam beer. But the other reason, it's uh, in Chile, we got almost uh, open economy, so we got great malts, uh, Patagonia malts, it's, you can talk to the guys there. Uh, Patagonia malt, it's uh, it's malting facility, facility. It's kind of a uh, 100 miles away from our house, so we have great malt, fresh malt. We got uh, hops from probably all over the world, but, but we don't have yeast. We just have dry yeast. So my uh, concern about uh, when I was getting my degree in brewing, 
uh, was how I can get more flavor from that yeast because almost probably all homebrewers in Chile are fermenting with SO5 and SO4. So, um, and probably one lager strain at S23 and that's it. So my solution was create these two fermenters um, with a kind of plastic solution in, on the top because I have a, gat, a cat. So uh, <laughs> uh, the, the door of the fermentation room have a picture of the cat with a cross in it, but the cat don't give a shit about that. <laughs> so so uh, after my second or third fermentation, I got the result that I, that I want because uh, we don't have uh, uh, homebrew uh, welders for make equipment for homebrewers, so we, and the stainless steel is uh, stupid, uh, expensive. So um, that was my solution to improve the flavor of my beers. So they are quite unique, uh, I think. This was a kind of a funny thing. I fell in love uh, after the open fermentation with the oak fermentation, so I can get a barrel for fermentation. So uh, a friend of mine sent me this kind of uh, oak spring, uh, French, French oak spring. So I, I put it inside the fermenter. This is a picture of a kind of a Firestone Walker style clone beer with a oak in primary fermentation inside the square. So um, I grow hops, not a big slice meal, but the, <laughs> uh, you can see the cat, the cat in the bottom <laughs> inspecting the hops. <laughs> it's always on it. It's all omnipresent. So this was the second uh, how uh, second harvest. My girlfriend is not in the picture because he took the picture. So you, we are as a forehand harvesting team. Um, it's a kind of wild variety. Uh, we really don't know when or where it came from. It's just in the nature. So I put it some rhizomes and it's kind of uh, probably 18 feet tall this year. So um, uh, what I do uh, in a regular basis with this is to put it in a bag, sit in, on top of the hops, extract the oxygen and put it in the freezer. So that's my solution to that <laughs> amount of hops. So and uh, uh, as you can see what my name appears, uh, I'm a microscope badass. Uh, my, my, my work on, the, on beer is try to improve the quality of beer from uh, nano brewers and home brewers. So I, I do a lot of microscope. This is a picture uh, from my microscope. You can see the round ones, big ones are G's, the other ones are enemies. There's a kind of a Chinese letters there. Uh, those are lactobacillus. Uh, and some other stuff that you can, I, I can show you more pictures. Uh, uh, yesterday I was, uh, spent all my morning with Rebecca Newman, so she was kind of a delight with these pictures because they don't see much lactobacillus at Summit. Uh, I don't know if you tried Summit before Rebecca, but um, uh, she is uh, really into the quality thing. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do kind of a, that thing of quality to home brewers. I'm trying to watch much beer I can. Um, and like I said always, the first bottle is for free. Uh, the second one, it's probably a few dollars, but the first bottle that I watch for every brewer is for free. And surprisingly, I receive just few bottles. So uh, people in Chile is not into quality. Uh, this is a, a kind of shame. We got a lot of issues of contamination probably. But uh, I'm a kind of a ambassador of quality. So I am uh, the bad guy with the bad news. Uh, there's a bad beer. Yeah, there's two kind of uh, brewers, brewers that have been contaminated and brewers that will be contaminated. So, <laughs> dude. <laughs> For the record, we are on time to have a Q&A, depending on what is about to happen. <laughs> For the record, I did my job, damn it. Peter Simons from Australia. Okay, no pressure then. <laughs> so, um, we might just, before we dive into uh, my uh, 
homebrewing uh, style, etc. Australia legalised homebrew uh, through Gough Whitlam in 1972, which meant homebrewers could legally homebrew, uh, whereas prior to that they had to get a licence to brew anything over 2% proof. Uh, the one qualification, of course, is you're not allowed to sell it. So I was very interested with the comment that you just brew and you pro-brew it instantly. I thought that was great. <laughs> um, not the situation in Australia. Uh, I first uh, started brewing something in the order of 20 years ago, and I did the kit and kilo. I was supported by the local homebrew store, as are most people in Australia, I think. Uh, went the slippery slope and did the partial mash. I then bought the kettle bought a cooler, uh, found a old copper washer. Uh, these are the washers you have when you used to wash the clothes and boil them up. Great hot liquor ton. Um, so I, I kept the basic components for many years and I added a pump. And then I created a Herms because somebody gave me an old still. So I threw away all the still bits and just left the heating coil and stuff. There's no real need to step mash. All these people at Brewlosophy and all the other people, they're saying, yeah, you don't need to do it. But that's not home brewing. Because you can do it, you should do it. Absolutely. So I built my own Herms. And quite honestly, I quite like the step mash, even if I only use it to step from uh, mash temperature up to mash out, because it's all automated, it's lovely. Anyway, so uh, on the right of the slide there is, I have an abiding fascination with real ale, and I scored that um, hand pump in the UK, and it traveled all the way around the world via uh, the States, and I wrote a big note inside my suitcase for the TSA, this, oh, I am a home brewer, this is a beer pump. So they didn't destroy it or anything, because it looks very suspicious with that handle and all that brass, you know. <laughs> now I was going to um, quote uh, Brew in the Bag as being an Australian invention, but I think that's actually contentious, so I'm going to go with no chill. Now, no chilling as a technique really started in the, in the homebrew industry where work kits were supplied to homebrewers. So instead of just having a can of extract, you actually got an 18 litre uh, container, which you may or may not water down a bit, uh, and just ferment it. So once you have those containers, the way the, those kits were produced, you, you can see in the next slide or so, it's coming straight out of the kettle, it's going hot, straight into the cube. You put the top on and you've got a cube, you're not wasting any water, um, you can do time shifting with this method and I know a lot of people say, oh the quality of this, oh you shouldn't do the oxidation, it works. <laughs> I've got a cube in my fridge at the moment, uh, it's, I've had it uh, ooh, four months and I may get round to brewing with it one day, you know, it's okay, I've had it room temperature, a lot of history from the guys on the Aussie Home Brewer uh, Forum that you can do a lot of things with the, with the no-chill. So you end up with some wort. So it, it's copied from the homebrew industry and as best as I can find out, about 2006, the Aussie Home Brewer Forum was a method of instead of having a lot of people individuals, which I think a lot of you guys have got the same problem, that forum uh, enabled people to communicate what they were doing and share. And that's how Brew in the Bag got refined and improved because of a bunch of people on that forum did a lot of work towards um, uh, disproving all those myths by actually doing it. The, um, the other thing I'm a, a bit keen on, and again, I feel quite inadequate sitting next to the gentleman on my right. Um, I grow hops. I grow Chinook, um, and I've got, um, what have I got? I've got hops from Tasmania of unknown origin. Uh, and my system is that um, I harvest about March, uh, and what I do, I, I dry them on, on wind, wind uh, fly screens in the garage, so the garage gets up to about 30, 30, 35 degrees, just good temperature for drying hops. Uh, and one of the hazards, as you can see on the right, uh, Barry Cranston, my good mate, he, um, he's picking away, helping me 
pick the hops off the vine. And all of a sudden, he leaps up in the air and he's found this spider. And it's a rather large spider. I was going to say something else. It's a rather large spider, but it's actually only a moderate bite. It's called a huntsman. It won't kill you, it might irritate you a bit. There are other ones, because it's a very dangerous place as Australia with, with wildlife, there are other ones that could do a lot more damage. Now, the internet is a wonderful thing. <laughs> my, my problem was I needed, I, I was not allowed anymore to fill up the food freezer <laughs> with hops. And I needed a method to compress the hops. So I looked on the internet and somebody had done something using a pipe and a pipe clamp. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, I think I can do that. So I borrowed a pipe clamp and I made hop plugs. This now means I, instead of having quite large bags, I can get, I can get uh, those are packs of uh, of 100 and 150 grams, so each one of those is 75 grams. So they're, they're, they're a really good size, so two of those would make you a nice IPA, and one, one of those plugs will do you nicely for a, for a pale ale. And a lot of guys in the ESB uh, Brew Club have used, the, um, uh, have used those plugs quite successfully. Now, I'm still doing all right for time, for so it's record, okay. Brian was awesome and printed up a two-page conversion chart for everybody at the table. Um, 75 grams is about 2.5 ounces, it looks Well, I like. refuse to compromise. You lot need to catch up. Ounces, <laughs> ounces. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm adding that extra minute onto my time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I really enjoy the hop growing. I, I think it, I'm sure when we chat about it later, it's it's really good value. So I would just like to mention the um, the, the state of play in in Australia for um, uh, the the club side of things. That some capital cities have really formalised clubs. Uh, the city where I live, uh, Sydney, we have a lot of informal people who like informal clubs and just go along and taste beer. But with that being said, we, we do have a similar competition to um, uh, NHC, where effectively the first round is a state qualifying competition. And if you uh, end up in the top three beers of that one, you go forward to the nationals. And the nationals, you use mostly BJCP guidelines plus a few uh, specific Australian styles. We also have a, a convention that, you know, might be a little bit similar to this one. Um, and we, I'm wearing it at the moment, the, the shirt from the fifth Australian uh, homebrew. And we've had all the usual suspects, uh, Jamil, Chris White. Um, and that's really, I think, lifted the, um, uh, the level of understanding in the whole industry. The thing that's not on the slide that's most important in Australia is most people will temperature control by actually fermenting in a fridge because uh, the, the, in the summer you, you really would have a problem with, with, with decent fermentation. And I'm not quite sure what, what these guys have in, the, in certain countries, whether they've got that problem as well. The one thing left to talk about is maybe how has the American homebrew scene affected them and how kind of reverse, like what is the global homebrew scene? And you don't all have to answer if you don't want. You don't have to make up an answer. But if someone wants to talk about kind of our global homebrew community, uh, just kind of riff on that for a, a minute. Yeah, I, I'd like to comment on that because um, this uh, panel has kind of led me to start researching more about what ties together our homebrew clubs in, in Mexico. And there, there was really nothing that I could find and nobody that could tell me uh, who knew about the, all the clubs and everything. So um, this kind of started moving a conversation towards creating an association that's going to oversee all the clubs and, and kind of lead them towards more education and, and, and better information. And so I, um, I, I like what the, the AHA started, which is a list of homebrew clubs that they could enlist themselves there. And so far, there's about 11 of the 30-some that I researched that are listed on there. So hopefully, there, there can be some uh, sharing of information between the two, and maybe we can help each other to uh, create something 
in Mexico where it's uh, more organized and we can have something like this, a conference that's um, directed towards homebrew uh, clubs or homebrewers to start learning a little bit more. Anybody else have anything else just kind of on that? I, I think it's, it's, it's worth saying that the, the way the, the homebrew club scene grew in Ireland, it was nearly a top-down approach where it wasn't local cl clubs came together. It was we had the national club first, and, which started meeting in Dublin. Some people said it's a long, time, a long drive to go to Dublin. Let's see if uh, a few people will meet in our local bar. And it's kind of, it's grown like, a, I don't know, it's propagated like yeast around the country now, whereas uh, every, every ta town of a certain size would have a homebrew club at this stage. And uh, it's, it, it really is, it's all thanks to the internet. So it doesn't matter if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, you can, there is the online community and you will find people nearby. And it's, 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 it's thanks to things like that where we've, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of tracked the American homebrew scene as a way of kind of launching our clubs. Hopefully now we'll go our own way because I think we've, we've kind of reached the, the, uh, the, the size that uh, we, we, we can kind of go our own way now. We don't need to do exactly everything that's done in America, but it's, it was just an interesting way to, uh, we, we seem to have done it backwards. We had the national organization first before the local clubs were founded. Again, it was a real pleasure to not only host and moderate that session, but to hear kind of the Q&A that followed afterwards, both on stage and in the room as the panelists kind of spread out and talk to people. Big shout out to AJ for letting us borrow that. Check out other conference seminars by clicking uh, Let's Brew section of the AHA website and then conference seminars. Big shout out to Brian, Gaston, EJ, Miguel, and Peter also, and the crew uh, at the AHA Governing Committee for kind of like seeing the vision or accepting the vision that I had for that and letting me roll with it. So appreciate y'all. Check out HomebrewCon 2018, the last weekend of June in beautiful Portland, Oregon. Uh, until the next episode, man, appreciate y'all. Happy New Year. Chat for chat, brew for brew.